In the midst of a vast sea of sand and brush stands Ayers Rock, a colossus shrouded in mystery. It is called Uluru, or the seat of the ancestors, by the Australian Aborigines to whom the rock is sacred. But did the 19th century explorer Ludwig Leichhardt die because he got too close to Uluru? He was the first white man to traverse the huge then unknown country. But on his next expedition, in the hostile interior of the continent, he vanished without a trace. One of the gods of Aboriginal creation is immortalized in Ayers Rock, Namagan, the Lord of Lightning, who cleaves the clouds with his stone axe. During the rain season in the tropical north of Australia, there are the most spectacular thunderstorms in the world as the lightning god delivers devastating storms. But this completes the cycle of the renewal for the land. The valleys and rivers, rocks, trees and waterways are to the Aborigines holy resting places. He who enters them must die. Like all Europeans at that time, Ludwig Leichhardt had no understanding of the worship of the Aborigines. But that was to change. In 1844, he wanted to traverse Australia from east to north. He was thought mad because no one had ever dared to enter the endless space of the unexplored continent. But the young natural scientist was determined to fulfill the dream of his life. From Brisbane, he aimed to reach Port Essington, a military post on the north coast, hoping to complete the journey in seven or eight months. Following his tracks proves difficult even today, for Leichhardt's route does not follow smooth, paved roads. Finding clean drinking water was the biggest problem for the group every day. They faced death from thirst, as most of the rivers were dried out at that time of year. Glenn McLaren understands how serious this problem was as he wrote a doctorate on Leichhardt's expedition. He followed the old route for over 4,000 kilometers by horse and motorbike, comparing Leichhardt's location entries with his own. He could recognize the actual camps and the water holes Leichhardt used. Leichhardt and his expedition members frequently were forced to drink water such as this, which is contaminated, even smelling on occasions, but they had no option. In, in, in most instances in arid inland Australia, uh, water's scarce and they would have had to have drunk out of small pools, contaminated pools such as this, and once they and their stock had, had depleted the, the supply, they would even have had to have dug down into the ground and let the water trickle back in. The countryside has hardly changed. The adventurers had to cross this rugged terrain, a challenge for both man and animal. They passed by holy places, unaware of the potential danger. The Aborigines they encountered usually fled in fright and panic. They had never seen white men, nor horses and oxen. At this time, the Aborigines had lived at least 50,000 years on the Australian continent. For a long time, the white man believed them to be wild and primitive because he failed to understand their complex religious world. The Aborigines passed on their knowledge in the form of dances, songs, drawings or stories. Their ancient laws, social orders, 
Myths and traditions are kept that way. An enormous archive is stored in the heads of a few chosen men. In such places as these rocks, they still celebrate their most secretive rituals. Here, boys are initiated to become men after suffering various rituals. The elders cut the candidate, knock out a front tooth, and cut deep marks on their bodies with stone knives. Ancient tablets of wood or stone, Jurungus, are engraved with magic symbols, coded messages from the dream time when their ancestors created life and land. Dream paths cross the continent like an invisible net. The ancestors gave a certain territory to each clan, which they marked with these dream paths. The Aborigines can see these paths, and even blindfolded they can find the one that marks the end of their territory. Because the Aborigines see mankind and nature as a unity, they feel part of the land. That is why each one respects the border of his neighbor. Ludwig Leichhardt was interested in the lifestyle of the Aborigines. He described their rituals and visited their deserted campgrounds, but he seldom made direct contact with them. His Aboriginal companion could not understand the Aborigines of other regions, as each tribe has its own language. The didgeridoo is possibly the oldest musical instrument in the world. The sound is made by a special breathing technique and the vibration of the lips on a hollow branch. The best instruments can be fashioned from the branches of the bloodwood tree, but only those which have first been hollowed out by termites. These men can recognize the best branches to use, even though nothing can be seen on the tree from the outside. The termites have done a good job, and the first trial already sounds promising. The guardians of the ancestral knowledge are allowed to paint the didgeridoo with red or yellow ochre, together with chalk and charcoal. Only they are aware of the secret stories which are hidden behind these designs. to play the didgeridoo at ceremonies when it is transformed into a holy instrument. On his journey, Leichhardt discovered Australia's biggest coal deposits. He meticulously noted what he discovered on his maps. The layers of coal are right under the topsoil. Leichhardt didn't have an official request to search for mineral resources. But as a serious natural scientist, he could not pass this way blindly, and Australia has profited from his precise observations. This is one of the largest uranium mines in the world, the Ranger Mine. When Leichhardt passed here, the radioactive metal had no scientific significance, and its danger was unknown. Leichhardt's plan was to reach his goal in eight months. He'd only covered half of his route when he made a fatal detour, which cost him another five weeks. It was the only time he made a mistake. His compass was broken, and he only had a sextant and an inadequate map to find his position. Technology today makes orientation child's play in comparison, using the Global Positioning Satellite System. 
recorded latitude figure and my GPS reading, which I've just taken, um, agree closely. In, in fact, his latitude reading is only approximately 400 metres to the south of this in error. Compared to the other major Australian exploration figures, uh, his results stand up particularly well and, and certainly the criticisms of him can't, cannot be substantiated. It really was an outstanding achievement. The Aborigines do not need any instruments. They know their territory in their sleep. Their photographic memory stores details of the landscape that may seem irrelevant, but which allow them to find even the most remote waterhole or ritual place. For a long time, they had to watch helplessly as the white man desecrated their holy grounds out of either ignorance or insensitivity. Leichhardt and his group travelled further into the depths of Aboriginal territories, land which was protected by spirits and religious faith. But they remained unaware of any menace. On June the 28th, 1844, they camped at the edge of a lagoon. They were in a relaxed mood. They were not lost and had had a good meal at last. That day, everything was fine. As Ludwig Leichhardt and his men rested on their perilous journey across the vast region of the Australian interior, they were oblivious of the anger they'd inflamed among the Aboriginal people. of the men were now on tenterhooks. Would the Aborigines strike again? Would they reach their goal or perish miserably? By now, the rivers, which were mostly dry before, were in flood and had turned into huge obstacles. So you have to realise that crossing rivers in this region is not just simply a matter of swimming horses and bullocks across. Leichhardt also had to ensure that his supplies were not wetted and, and also that he avoided the ever-present danger of saltwater crocodiles. Their name is misleading. The seven-metre monsters are just as happy in fresh water. They live in large numbers in the waters of northern Australia. Crocodile attacks that end in death are not uncommon. The chain of mishaps for Leichhardt did not end. Four horses drowned in one river, and with that, Leichhardt had no more reserve animals. He had to leave behind a large part of his botanical collection. Finally, after months of terrible struggle, they saw the sea on the distant horizon. Essington still lay many kilometers further north. To get there, they had to go back into the hostile inner country. The climate turned tropical, and the humid heat became unbearable. They were in no position to acknowledge the landscape. 
the spectacular rock paintings of the Aborigines stayed hidden from them. In the Kakadu National Park, as well as in neighboring Arnhem Land, are 20,000 such open-air galleries, forming the largest collection of rock paintings in the world. Leichhardt mentioned only one rock painting, a tortoise of red ochre. On December the 17th, 1845, the journey was finally accomplished. More than 15 months after their start from Brisbane, Leichhardt and his companions arrived at Port Essington. They were totally gaunt and tattered at the end of their strength. They endured inhuman strain, becoming the first to discover an east-north route through the Australian continent traveled 4,500 kilometers through unknown country, from coast to coast, as acknowledged by historian Peter Forrest. Well, it was a great moment for Leichhardt personally, but it was a great moment in Australian history because Leichhardt had traveled over more than 4,000 kilometers of unknown country, He'd found a way from the settled districts in the south right through to this northern outpost, Port Essington, and that way could be used as a trade route for bringing livestock and goods overland to be exported through Port Essington, Essington to India and other British possessions in Southeast Asia. So Leichhardt brought the southern settled parts of Australia into the closer embrace of the British Empire. So it was a great personal triumph for Leichhardt, achieved at a time when other Australian explorers were being forced into retreat. So at that moment of sweet success, even then, I'm sure, Leichhardt was planning for an even greater achievement, to cross the continent from the east coast to the west and then come back again. But this achievement was never realised. The entire expedition disappeared somewhere in the immensity of central Australia without a trace. There were eight men, equipment, provisions, 50 oxen and 20 pack mules. Search parties brought back only rumors and assumptions. 64 years later, in 1912, this ornamental metal piece from a rifle appeared. It was supposedly found at a spot that is not marked on any map. Further research is impossible. But this piece of metal originates from the time Leichhardt disappeared. The last big search expedition was dispatched by the Australian government in 1936. Farmers had found human bones on the edge of the vast Simpson Desert. This expedition discovered the remains of a large camp. After sifting many cubic meters of sand, they found two English coins among other objects. Both were in circulation three years before Leichhardt's disappearance. They also found the remains of a leather sole with easily recognized seam holes. The skeletal parts and tooth fragments were Aborigine, and two of Leichhardt's companions had been Aborigines. There were also some pieces of metal but these were unidentifiable. More recently, more bones have been found in various places in the Simpson Desert. Perhaps in these remote places, the grave of the explorer will be found after 150 years. How could Ludwig Leichhardt have perished? Did he drown in the desert? It sounds absurd, but if it rains for weeks further north, Gigantic flood waves crash through the dry river valleys and carry everything before them in their path. Did they all die of thirst 
The desert offers little comfort. These new remains are not easy to reach. The Simpson Desert sprawls across more than 150,000 square kilometers. Experts from Brisbane meet at the site. They're all scientists, a forensic doctor, an archaeologist, and two gene specialists. Oh, about, uh, 20 hours altogether. Oh, well. We've been on the go ever since we left. They can identify Ludwig Leichhardt's skeleton if they can match the DNA from the bones with the blood of his great-great-nephew, who was traced in Germany. The extracted genetic fingerprints would solve the uncertain destiny of his famous relative. But for that, the forensic scientists must first determine if these are the bones of a white man. Well, the left temporal. It is exacting work. The zygomatic bone. The first skeleton lies in flat ground, still half covered by sand. The archaeologist on the right is looking after the expert uncovering of the bones. A piece of a tooth will be the decisive sample for Dr. Walter Wood. From the cranial fragments, we have some clues that it might be Aboriginal, but they're not definite. But we did find just one tooth fragment, which I've got here. It's a fragment of probably a canine tooth and the crown is very well worn. And to me, that's very indicative of Aboriginal uh, dentitions, uh, particularly dentitions that have been exposed to traditional dyes. Yeah. Yes. At an adjoining site, Dr. Wood again attempts to determine if a tooth can be Aborigine. This gravesite points from north to south as well. Which is very typical. So... Uh, it certainly isn't a European, and uh, it's definitely not like her. The scientists arrive at a sobering conclusion. To, to, my, way, to my way of thinking, it, it definitely suggests it's an Aboriginal burial. Yeah. Um, yeah. Still, still oriented in the same way as those other Aboriginal burials, and uh, and it's got this cultural material here too, which yeah. would suggest that it is Aboriginal. Yeah, for sure. So where in this mysterious heart of Australia is Leichhardt's grave? The immense emptiness may never give it up. When the Greek poet Sophocles observed in Antigone, the greatest marvel of all is man, he meant it. Men in ancient Greece considered women physically and intellectually inferior. As second-class citizens, they could not own property and most remained uneducated. To escape this cultural oppression, women found in their religion an avenue for unfettered expression. They worshipped their own gods and goddesses, celebrating their fertility in a religious ceremony called the Thesmophoria, a secret ritual forbidden to men. The playwright Aristophanes wrote a comedy about the women at the Thesmophoria, but it was only conjecture. The ritual remained shrouded in mystery. Recent excavations on Lesbos have shed light on what history has largely ignored, the lives of Greek women. Archaeologists have discovered one of the sanctuaries where the mysterious rites of the Thesmophoria took place. Their findings may hold the key to one of the best kept secrets of the ancient world. A 
Of the hundreds of Greek islands in the Aegean Sea, one of the largest remains one of the least explored, the island of Lesbos. In its time, Lesbos thrived as one of the leading cultural centers of Greek civilization. The forest-covered island produced one of the greatest writers of the ancient world, Sappho the Poetess. This extraordinary woman invented the intensely personal love lyric. Some scholars believe that she initiated a school of sorts to teach her art to other women, an exceptional feat in a time and culture that considered women unworthy of education. Since the time of the Trojan War in the 12th century BC, Lesbos has been of enormous strategic importance. Its narrow channel was the principal route along the coast of Asia Minor to the Dardanelles, the legendary city of Troy, and eventually to the Black Sea. Over the millennia, empire after empire fought for control of the island. First the Persians, the Athenians, Romans, and then the Turks occupied Lesbos. Every conquering culture has had a lasting impact. Despite its rich history, the island remained largely unexplored by archaeologists. Much of the island's past has been obliterated by its modern cities. The capital of Lesbos, Mytilene, sits directly over the ruins of another city, which dates back to the 4th century BC. In 1983, an international team of scholars led by Canadian archaeologist Hector Williams began the first systematic study of Lesbos. When we began to work in Mytilene in 1983, we looked for a good place to dig that had no modern habitation on top of it as much as the town does. High on the outskirts of Mytilene are the remains of a sprawling medieval castle. Williams and his team reasoned that an even more ancient citadel might well lie beneath it. They hoped the castle had protected the site. Faced with the enormity of the castle grounds, the team borrowed a tool from geologists, a resistivity meter, to help them locate underground anomalies. But as is so often the case in archaeology, High technology sometimes benefits from Lady Luck. Near the summit, the resistivity meter revealed an east-west platform that the team hoped might be the ruin of a classical Greek temple. Unfortunately, it turned out to be a 17th century Turkish road. But as they dug through the dirt and further back in time, they came upon more exciting finds. In 1984, when we got permission to dig our first test trench at the site, we, for the first few days, went down through very thick layers of Turkish material. We thought, oh no, we may not have anything earlier. But then we got a little bit further and discovered uncontaminated uh, deposits of Roman material from the first century. Below that, Greek material. And out of the Greek levels began to come figurines, heads, mostly of women, but with some men and children and a few animals. And they were the kinds of figurines that we associate with ancient Greek sanctuaries, places of worship, the kinds of things that people would offer to the divinity. And we knew then that somewhere nearby, there must be an ancient sanctuary. Hundreds of fragments of female terracotta figurines, dating to the 4th century BC, pointed to the religious significance of the site. Clearly, they had located an ancient sanctuary, a temple to a god or a goddess, but to which one? In the ancient Greek religion, people worshipped a variety of gods and goddesses. An entire pantheon of deities ruled from atop Mount Olympus. The Greeks venerated all of them through ritual and ceremony. Certain gods or goddesses required special offerings. Today, their sanctuaries can be identified by these remains. Because the figurines found at the site were mostly of women worshippers, often with their hands upraised in prayer, the team concluded that they were associated with female deities. The most important type for identifying the divinity of the sanctuary was this variety here. 
a woman with a hydria or water jar on her head. This kind of hydrophorus, as she's called, is always found in Demeter sanctuaries and thus indicated to us that we were on the trail of the goddess. In Greek mythology, the goddess Demeter was never far from her beloved daughter Kore. Hades, the king of the underworld, fell passionately in love with the beautiful Kore. He kidnapped and stole her away to the underworld. Kore's mother Demeter was seized with grief. In her mourning, she allowed the world to grow cold and the land to fall fallow. Concerned with the death that was gripping the earth, the other gods finally intervened. They persuaded Hades to release Kore to her mother. But before he let her go, the king of the underworld gave Kore a pomegranate to eat. The seeds compelled her to spend part of each year in the underworld. So for three quarters of the year, while Demeter and Kore are reunited, the earth blossoms. In the fall, Demeter grieves for her missing daughter and the world turns infertile again. In this way, the Greeks explain the seasons. In contrast to the capricious gods of the Greek pantheon, Demeter and Kore offered consolation and comfort to their worshippers. They personified and could control the cycles of life, death and rebirth. At the festivals dedicated to Demeter and Kore, women celebrated their own life and fertility as well as that of the land. They performed rituals to ensure another year of health and prosperity for themselves, their families, and their community. The worship of Demeter and Kore was open to all, but during a special ritual called the Thesmophoria, it was strictly women only. Not only were men forbidden from the ceremonies, they were forbidden from knowing anything that happened during the rites. Female participants of the Thesmophoria faced death by the gods if they revealed the secret rites. The ceremonies marked the only time during the year when married women were allowed out on their own. Cherishing these moments of freedom, the women kept their secrets well. No accounts of the rites survive. An incredible accomplishment, considering that the rites were practiced all over Greece. Kevin Clinton has dedicated much of his academic career studying just this mysterious ritual. The Thesmophoria was one of the um, most widespread Greek cults. Uh, we find it in Greek cities as far north as the Black Sea and as far south as the coast of North Africa. And we find it as at least as early as the 8th century BC. Um, and from everything we know about it, it probably went much further back in time than that, probably to the prehistoric period. In the late 5th century BC, the great playwright Aristophanes wrote a comedy called The Women at the Thesmophoria. In it, a handful of male characters attempt to spy on the mysteries of the women's nighttime worship. Aristophanes, working under the same constraints as modern scholars, could only guess at what went on at the Thesmophoria, but he suspected that it was not entirely wholesome. The excavations on Lesbos produce literally tons of pottery used in sanctuary offerings. In assessing these artifacts, Williams and his team were confident they had uncovered a sanctuary to Demeter and Kore. But absolute proof was soon uncovered, and in the most extraordinary form. The excavation unearthed a series of folded lead strips about four inches long with bronze nails stuck through them. And the archaeologists recognized these as curse tablets, a relic of black magic found throughout the Greek and Roman world. David Jordan is a leading authority on curse tablets. Curse tablets are generally small pieces of lead about the size of a playing card. What you did with them was to inscribe onto these tablets names of your enemies. And then you put the curse tablets into graves, of generally graves of people thought to have died before their time, because these people were thought to have exuded a special kind of pollution. The idea was that if you could somehow affect the names with this pollution, you affected the persons of their bearers. 
Another place of deposit was in shrines and such associated with the dead, for example, in sanctuaries of Demeter. Unrolling and deciphering the cursed tablets proved extremely difficult. The words had been scratched in the lead with a pin, and much of the writing had been obliterated by the spike. But after long study, Jordan was able to decipher several of them. What he found wouldn't surprise most of us. The author of the tablets had put a curse on local jurors. One of the enduring contributions that ancient Greeks bequeathed to Western civilization was litigiousness. They had a passion for fighting things out in court. The names on the cursed tablets that Jordan found included lawyers and participants in lawsuits of some 2,300 years ago. There was a lot of good evidence that this was a sanctuary of Demeter, but what really clinched the identification was that these tablets say that they are dedicated to Demeter. The sanctuary of Demeter proved to be a popular place, capable of holding hundreds, even thousands of worshippers. Well, the center of the Thesmophorian festival probably took place in this large altar here. We know it's an altar because within it were found numerous burned grains, and these would have been burnt as offerings to Demeter herself. Whereas on this side, on, in this semicircular attachment, we found a large number of charred piglet bones. Now, these piglets were sacrificed here. Some were burned completely here, while others were butchered, and the meat was taken over there, where it was consumed in a feast in the dining halls. Scattered around the altars were pits made to hold offerings like cups and dishes, which the participants smashed during the ritual. The women came from all social classes. The poor offered modest and undecorated pottery, while the wealthier women provided fine pieces of Athenian red figure pottery. Hundreds of lamps were also found at the site, confirming that much of the three-day event took place at night. The burn marks on these lamps indicate that they were used just once and discarded, in much the same way as votive candles are used in a church today. But most poignantly, the fragments of thousands of terracotta figurines testify to the popularity of this sanctuary through the centuries. These fragile pieces of art were sculpted specifically as offerings. We found a great variety of different types of figurines in the sanctuary. Some were beautiful products of the choroplast or the figurine maker's art. For example, this old woman of the second century before Christ is very well modeled and is a really clear depiction of age. Others, however, are somewhat cruder, like this younger woman's face. We also have animals, like these horses, or a rather endearing little dog in this case. Not all animals are quite so well done. Uh, a bird, for example, is very crudely rendered. All in all, we must have close to a thousand inventory figurines from the sanctuary now, and as I mentioned, dozens of different varieties among them. After the festival ends, and bury them as permanent offerings. Archaeologists uncovered yet one more clue which added to the of the pound doesn't fall. Throughout the sanctuary, the remains of thousands of animals were found, slaughtered as sacrificial offerings. Near Mytilene today, citizens of Lesbos participate in a modern religious festival. This 200-year-old ceremony celebrates the saving of their city from Turkish thieves by the intervention of a Christian saint. This night they will sacrifice a bull. At dawn they will feast on its boiled remains. This tradition of animal sacrifice echoes the island's pagan past. The religious rites of the Thesmophoria required the sacrifice of thousands of piglets, sheep, and goats. 
The bones of these animals have been found at the Mytilene excavation. These testify to the passion with which the women of Lesbos embrace the rituals of Demeter and Kore. This contrast to their regimented daily lives. In ancient Greece, only aristocratic women attained a level of social freedom. It was just such an aristocrat who instructed female pupils in artistic expression through poetry. Harry Edinger, a Greek classic scholar, has contemplated the lives of women like Sappho. There was something about the society of Mytilene that allowed her to develop a tremendous talent for writing poetry. And the Greeks of all cities came to esteem her very highly. She was called the Tenth Muse, as if a human being had elevated herself to the rank of the gods of art. This is a remarkable achievement, and she has fascinated everyone ever since. Tragically, the world lost much of Sappho's poetry, both through suppression by the Christian church and during the fire that destroyed the great library of Alexandria in the third century AD. But the powerful fragments that remain have influenced love poetry for 1,600 years. For when I look at you for a moment, then is it no longer possible for me to speak? But my tongue has snapped. At once, a subtle fire has crept up under my flesh. I see nothing with my eyes, my ears roar. Cold sweat covers me, a trembling seizes me, and it seems to me I nearly die. Since antiquity, the beauty of Sappho's poems have been overshadowed by controversy. Because many of her surviving works are addressed to her female students, it has been suggested that Sappho's relationships with her pupils were of a sexual nature. There's no doubt that she was deeply emotionally involved with these women. She describes what are often crises of feeling when uh, she is uh, watching these women or talking to other people. She uh, describes them as uh, people for whom she longs uh, after they have left. Extraordinarily uh, difficult uh, kind of poetry for us to imagine. Uh, the imputation that she was involved physically with these women was already made in antiquity. Uh, people deduced from them that they were autobiographical poems declaring her physical love for these young women. We have no way of telling. The great poetess herself probably participated in the rites of the Thesmophoria. Quite possibly she did so at the site of the sanctuary on the Mytilene Acropolis. Although most of the artifacts date back only to the 4th century BC, some date back farther. The Thesmophoria itself seems to reach back to the very roots of Greek civilization. Here and there we find pockets of pottery going back to her age, around 600 years before Christ. We pull out sherds like this one, and who knows? She may have eaten from it, she may have drunk from it. It's the right time, but unless we were to find an inscription or some sort of incontrovertible evidence like that, it can only be an attractive hypothesis. The artist Sappho inspired continued to flourish on Lesbos after her death. But as the centuries passed, the culture faced onslaught after onslaught from invading empires, until finally the conquering Romans dealt the final blow. They dumped tons of fill on the ancient citadel, covering the altars of the sanctuary. The site was abandoned until medieval times. Here on the Acropolis of Mytilene, we've dug 56 trenches. In none of these trenches have we found anything later than the mid-first century after Christ until about the 11th century, a gap of a thousand years. In an effort to understand the abandonment of the sanctuary, archaeologists will continue to search for clues.
It's possible that they moved it somewhere else in the city. It's possible that it became unfashionable. It's possible the area became taboo for some reason. We're still looking for an answer to that mystery. The keepers of fertility, the protectors of the land, lost their sacred rituals at the hands of violent invaders. The Thesmophoria had come to an end. A tradition that reached back to prehistoric days had disappeared forever. The women of ancient Greece spent much of their lives following the societal conventions of the day. They expressed their feelings to each other and to their goddesses. Exactly what went on during the ceremonies of the Thesmophoria may never be fully revealed, but the voices of the women who came to the sanctuary to escape the drudgery of their daily lives still echo on the island of Lesbos. Because the Aborigines see mankind and nature as a unity, they feel part of the land. That is why each one respects the border of his neighbor. Ludwig Leichhardt was interested in the lifestyle of the Aborigines. He described their rituals and visited their deserted campgrounds but he seldom made direct contact with them. His Aboriginal companion could not understand the Aborigines of other regions, as each tribe has its own language. The didgeridoo is possibly the oldest musical instrument in the world. The sound is made by a special breathing technique and the vibration of the lips on a hollow branch. The best instruments can be fashioned from the branches of the bloodwood tree, but only those which have first been hollowed out by termites. These men can recognize the best branches to use, even though nothing can be seen on the tree from the outside. This completes the cycle of the renewal for the land. The valleys and rivers, rocks, trees and waterways are to the Aborigines holy resting places. He who enters them must die. Like all Europeans at that time, Ludwig Leichhardt had no understanding of the worship of the Aborigines. But that was to change. In 1844, he wanted to traverse Australia from east to north. He was thought mad because no one had ever dared to enter the endless space of the unexplored continent. But the young natural scientist was determined to fulfill the dream of his life. From Brisbane, he aimed to reach Port Essington, a military post on the north coast hoping to complete the journey in seven or eight months. Following his tracks proves difficult even today. For Leichhardt's route does not follow smooth, paved roads. In the midst of a vast sea of sand and brush stands Ayers Rock, a colossus shrouded in mystery. It is called Uluru, or the seat of the ancestors, 
by the Australian Aborigines to whom the rock is sacred. But did the 19th century explorer Ludwig Leichhardt die because he got too close to Uluru? He was the first white man to traverse the huge, then unknown country. But on his next expedition, in the hostile interior of the continent, he vanished without a trace. One of the gods of Aboriginal creation is immortalized in Ayers Rock, Namagan, the Lord of Lightning, who cleaves the clouds with his stone axe. During the rain season in the tropical north of Australia, there are the most spectacular thunderstorms in the world, as the lightning god delivers devastating storms. Finding clean drinking water was the biggest problem for the group every day. They faced death from thirst, as most of the rivers were dried out at that time of year. Glenn McLaren understands how serious this problem was, as he wrote a doctorate on Leichhardt's expedition. He followed the old route for over 4,000 kilometers by horse and motorbike, comparing Leichhardt's location entries with his own. He could recognize the actual camps and the water holes Leichhardt used. Leichhardt and his expedition members frequently were forced to drink water such as this, which is contaminated, even smelling on occasions, but they had no option. In, in, in most instances in arid inland Australia, uh, water scarce and they would have had to have drunk out of small pools, contaminated pools such as this, and once they and their stock had, had depleted the, the supply, they would even have had to have dug down into the ground and let the water trickle back in. The countryside has hardly changed. The adventurers had to cross this rugged terrain, a challenge for both man and animal. They passed by holy places, unaware of the potential danger. The Aborigines they encountered usually fled in fright and panic. They had never seen white men, nor horses and oxen. At this time, the Aborigines had lived at least 50,000 years on the Australian continent. For a long time, the white man believed them to be wild and primitive because he failed to understand their complex religious world. The Aborigines passed on their knowledge in the form of dances, songs, drawings or stories. Their ancient laws, social orders, myths and traditions are kept that way. An enormous archive is stored in the heads of a few chosen men. In such places as these rocks, they still celebrate their most secretive rituals. Here, boys are initiated to become men after suffering various rituals. The elders cut the candidate, knock out a front tooth, and cut deep marks on their bodies with stone knives. Ancient tablets of wood or stone, Jurungus, are engraved with magic symbols, coded messages from the dream time when their ancestors created life and land. Dream paths cross the continent like an invisible net. The ancestors gave a certain territory to each clan, which they marked with these dream paths. The Aborigines can see these paths, and even blindfolded they can find the one that marks the end of their territory.